Okay, folks, uh, we're going to get started with the um, analysis portion of uh, part seven of Quigley's Tragedy and Hope. And, uh, you know, in the last part, we were talking about it, how industrialism, liberalism, capitalism, and, and that kind of stuff. So um, here he's going to extend this a little bit and give you examples and, and tie it in with uh, uh, his the previous parts of the chapter. And um, he said, we have already given some attention to the fashion in which a number of Western European innovations, such as industrialism and the demographic explosion, diffuse outward to the peripheral non-European world at such different rates of speed that they that, that they arrived in Asia in quite a different order from that in which they had left Western Europe. The same phenomenon can be seen within Western civilization in regard to the 19th century characteristics of Europe, which we have enumerated. Okay, he gives you examples of uh, nationalism and the rates of speed that it formed inside uh, Europe and its and their results. And, how, and then he gives you an example of of, um, of how it diffused out to Russia and then out to the rest of the world and uh and its effects and then then he's going to then he's going to go into a special case of um of you know even though uh it, they're within uh, western europe um germany and italy didn't follow the pattern of of everything that happened within england okay he, he gives you an, an example of how Socialism and universal free education appeared in Central Europe before it it appeared in England, and socialism is a product of of uh, Central Europe, whereas liberalism and uh, democracy is more of a uh, a pattern of um, say the uh, the Western Western Europe rather than Central Europe. Okay, here he's going to give an example of how uh, the different pieces, if they don't arrive in the same order, it can uh, complicate things or give a different result. Okay, he says, as an example of such complication, we might mention that Western Europe, nationalism, industrialism, and liberalism, and democracy were reached in that order. But in Germany, they all appeared about the same time. And to the Germans, it appeared that they could achieve nationalism and industrialism, both of which they wanted more rapidly and more successfully if they sacrificed liberalism and democracy. Thus, Germany's nationalism was achieved un in an undemocratic way by blood and iron, as Bismarck put it, while the industrialism was achieved under state auspices rather than through liberalism. And when you have industrialism, and um, nationalism married together without liberalism and democracy, you get what we call fascism. So fascism was not invented as we believed or as they would have you believe under Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich. It was actually in the Second Reich uh, under Bismarck. It was actually Otto Bismarck that with the blood and iron and uh, without uh, having nationalism and industry without democracy and liberalism. You can still see that today because most of your banks are still more state run or state controlled uh, or industry controlled um, in Germany. You know, the German, German financing in, in strict guidelines, guidelines is still is uh, in order. You can see that how it plays out uh, under Merkel, you know, even in the EU, because the way Germans and the Swiss like to bank is much different than the way, uh, say, England and France and even Italy um, like to bank. Even the way they handle uh, um uh, crises, you know, how they had the different ways that they wanted to handle the Greek crisis is different. So you can still see how these things still play out even under uh, um, 
you know, even today, even though it was developed a hundred years ago. And said, accordingly, while Western Europe with plenty of capital and cheap democratic weapons could finance its industrialization with liberalism and democracy in Central Europe, Central Europe had difficulty financing industrialism. And said, this meant that the capital for railroads and factories had to be raised with government assistance. Liberalism waned, rising nationalism encouraged this tendency, and the undemocratic nature of existing weapons made it clear that both liberalism and democracy were living in the most precarious existence. In other words, it was, you know, um, after World War I, when Germany was defeated, they tried their hand at democracy, they had tried their hand at liberalism, but it failed, and then it, they reverted back to what they knew. They reverted back to fascism. They reverted back to blood and iron. Uh, they were uh, reverted back back to warfare under uh, Adolf Hitler. See, in Quigley's mind, nationalism and industrialism or industry is a more sturdy trait than some of the other esoteric things. And uh, he says the le the less sturdy traits are more fragile. Here, 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 here in his quote, he said, among these less sturdy traits of Western Europe's great century, you might mention liberalism, democracy, the parliamentary system, optimism and the belief in, in the inevitable, in, inevitable progress. These were, we might say, flowers of such a delicate nature that they could not survive any extended period of stormy weather. And he said in the 20th century subjected them to long periods of stormy weather. So, you know, this is a quote. This is a quote that you might use um, someplace else. So we're going to, you know, we're going to look at this later on in the chapter, uh, later on in, in, in this book. And uh, these things will come back. You know, he's going to go more into depth when he looks at uh, each of these particular societies individually.